The News 4 Rundown is sponsored by FH Fur. Right now, tracking Idalia. It's now a tropical storm heading north after soaking the Sunshine State as a hurricane. And then, saving our cherished cherry blossoms. News 4's Amy Cho will tell you the new plans to fix crumbling tidal basin walls, plus a News 4 I-Team report. I'm Tracy Wilkins. Coming up on News 4, the FBI Bureau is literally falling apart, and the process to relocate it fell apart for a while, too. Now that there are conversations happening again, we're going to take you inside of the debate over which community should get it and why. You're watching the News 4 Rundown. Thanks for joining us for the News 4 Rundown, our newscast streaming for you. I'm Sean Yancey. And I'm Tommy McFly. It's Wednesday, August 30th, but let's get started with some of the top stories we're following for you today. Five teens were arrested in D.C. after a series of carjackings. In one case, a teen armed with a golf club was part of a group that tried to steal a car on Capitol Hill. One of the teens was arrested in connection with that particular incident. In all, police arrested two 13-year-old girls and three boys, 14, 15, and 16. They're charged in multiple carjackings and robberies. This is curfew for kids 16 and younger goes into effect Friday. These seven neighborhoods will be the focus of the Youth Safety Initiative. The curfew starts at 11 p.m. and goes to 6 a.m. weeknights. It starts at midnight on weekends. Officers will begin picking up unsupervised teenagers who break curfew. They will take them to the Department of Youth Services. Another scary moment involving Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell for the second time in weeks. He's appeared to freeze during a press conference, this time in his home state of Kentucky. When his staff approached him to ask if he heard the question, he didn't immediately respond to them either. A similar incident, you might recall, happened during a press conference at the Capitol back in July. Hurricane Idalia has weakened to a tropical storm now. In fact, it made landfall this morning in Florida as a Category 3 hurricane. Yeah, the storm ripped through Florida, Georgia, and is about to hit the Carolinas before heading off into the Atlantic. Back in Florida, though, it's kicking up strong winds and a powerful storm surge. This is video from the Big Bend region where the storm first made landfall. The surge, it flooded coastal communities when Idalia pushed on shore. The hurricane also brought catastrophic winds strong enough to rip the roof off this gas station wow. and send the awning flying. NBC's Jay Gray is in Gainesville, Florida tonight with the latest. Hurricane Idalia punishing Florida's coast. Sustained winds of 125 miles an hour at landfall peeling away this gas station canopy. It's very crazy. And a storm surge of 10 feet or more pushing a wall of water into places it's never been before. Idalia speeding up over land, but maintaining its intensity. The trade-off is, is we get a little less rain maybe, but still enough rain to cons cause considerable impacts from flash and urban flooding, uh, especially as we go into tonight and Thursday. As the system pushes through. This is an exceptional one, big one. Residents in Cedar Key get a first-hand look at their soaked and battered town. It doesn't look good. Uh, our, all of our commercial buildings downtown are underwater. Uh, a, a huge percentage of our homes have been inundated with water. Um, you can see I'm standing in the middle of uh, State Road 24 right now, and it's uh, completely underwater. Near Tampa, entire communities flooded. Paddleboards now the best way to get around. Everything's underwater. It's like Venice, <laughs> Italy. Task force teams and first responders working through that water and into some of the hardest hit areas. All eight uh, urban search and rescue teams uh, are uh, deployed. Uh, our National Guard uh, has folks uh, in places like Taylor County. Uh, they're getting on scene there to do things like clear uh, major pieces of the roads and, and get debris that, is, that has been uh, knocked around. But not knocked out, though in some places it will take months to recover. Jay Gray, NBC News, Gainesville. Thanks, Jay. And Idalia is disrupting air travel. I was to take a live look now at Reagan National Airport. There have been dozens of flight delays already and a handful of cancellations. Many of these canceled flights were, of course, headed to Florida. Major airlines are helping passengers impacted by Idalia. They are allowing rebooking at no extra charge. And thousands of flights have already been impacted. If you've got a flight coming up, be sure to check with your carriers first. And as we continue to track Idalia, it's hitting hard and it's hitting strong with storms that pose a threat to our area as well. 
And climate change only amplifies all those risks. In fact, D.C.'s famed cherry trees on the Tidal Basin are already seeing the effects of rising sea levels. And this week, the National Park Service announced a major plan to repair that seawall, and they help it will keep our cherry blossoms safe. News 4's Amy Cho explains the plan and how long it's expected to take. Well, unfortunately, things are looking pretty grim here at the Tidal Basin right now. This seawall here is supposed to keep this water from coming ashore, but as you can see, that is not going so well. The National Park Service actually had to block this whole area off because it keeps flooding at high tide. But there is some good news on the way. The Park Service just announced it is partnering with a contractor to try and fix this wall over the next three years. The walkway goes underwater twice a day, every day at high tide. This brown, muddy mess is the sad reality along parts of the Tidal Basin. According to the National Park Service, there are two problems here. One, the seawall is old and sinking deeper into the ground. And two, the water is quickly rising. It's a safety concern for us, um, and it is also damaging the iconic cherry trees around the Tidal Basin. Mike Litters with the National Park Service says they just awarded a contract yesterday for a three-year project to fix the wall. They chose a construction company from Maine and say the goal is to extend the wall's lifespan by 100 years. They plan to anchor the wall to the bedrock in the ground to make it more stable. The sooner we can get this done, the sooner we'll stop that damage. But unfortunately, this situation is something we're seeing all around the world due to climate change. Scientists at NOAA say we could expect a foot of sea level rise in the next 30 years. We should expect not only this extra foot of sea level rise, but more flooding. What used to be sort of minor nuisance flooding now is going to become about a foot deeper and happening at about the similar frequency. This video from two years ago shows the entire tidal basin being flooded after a storm. The National Park Service says it hopes to start the wall construction by the middle of next year. And to give you an idea of how badly these repairs are needed, the National Park Service says some parts of the Tidal Basin are still the original construction all the way back to the 18 and 1900s. Reporting along the Tidal Basin, Amy Cho, News 4. Thanks a lot, Amy. I am singularly focused on Stumpy, the cute cherry blossom Aww. tree, the one that's all gnarled, that is like a symbol yeah. of resilience. Yeah. I hope there's a Stumpy plan in the new plan I'm to sure fix the seawall. Maybe they'll <laughs> move Stumpy over to another location. So. I'll be out there with the Save Stumpy signs. <laughs> the National Park Service says it will have to close parts of the Tidal Basin during construction because there will be large equipment used in the repairs there. Mm -hmm. Now tonight, survivors are upset after a child sex assault case against the former Archbishop of Washington was dismissed. A judge ruled the former Cardinal Theodore McCarrick is not competent to stand trial. McCarrick is now 93 years old. He pled not guilty to charges he assaulted a teenage boy in Massachusetts in 1970. A forensic psychologist in the state testified that McCarrick has cognitive issues. Now today, SNAP, the survivor's network of those abused by priests, issued a statement that reads in part, our hearts agonize for McCarrick's victim. And regardless of today's decision, we stand in solidarity with him and will always believe him. In our opinion, the verdict in this case has already been rendered. Now McCarrick was defrocked in 2019 after the court uh, the church trial, excuse me, found him guilty of sexually abusing minors. Now, he also faces a similar charge in Wisconsin and has a hearing in that case next month. Well, in the next few weeks, we could learn where the new FBI headquarters will be located after years of planning to move it out of the district and years of the building literally falling apart with employees inside. There are three sites under consideration in our area, and one of the biggest criteria for which one will win is what the FBI facility will mean to the community around it. Investigative reporter Tracy Wilkins has been talking with leaders from local government to Capitol Hill about what's at stake and how we got here. Dedicated in 1975, the Federal Bureau of Investigation building on Pennsylvania Avenue is an example of brutalist architecture. Large, imposing, chunky, brutal. The building's namesake, former FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover, was also considered brutal by many for his illegal monitoring programs targeting prominent civil rights leaders like Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X. Soon this headquarters will relocate, more than a change of address, some hope it will benefit the very communities that once felt targeted and in the years since left behind. The commander in chief of our country has said that he believes that equity 
ought to be a part of all of these selections, including uh, this one. Prince George's County Executive Angela Also Brooks points to President Biden's executive orders on advancing racial equity and support of underserved communities for why her county should be home to the future FBI headquarters. What we're talking about is how we use taxpayer dollars to create job centers, to also create economic opportunity. The majority black county has two potential sites under consideration. The former Landover Mall owned by the Lerner family that also owns the national baseball team and Greenbelt Metro and part of its parking lot. The third option is across state lines in Springfield, Virginia and Fairfax County. This community also reflects a need community. Fairfax County Supervisor Rodney Lusk says the people who live near the potential Springfield site deserve those benefits too. The location under consideration is currently a General Services Administration warehouse area and in one of the more diverse parts of majority white and affluent Fairfax County. This is not Great Falls, this is not Tyson's, this is not um, McLean. We are looking at a totally different community. Census data shows Springfield as a majority minority community with its largest minority group, nearly 30 percent, identifying as Asian. It has a median household income of $109,000. Landover and Greenbelt are also majority minority communities with 70 percent of the Landover community identifying as black with a median income of 64000 and 45 percent of Greenbelt residents reporting they're black with a median household income of nearly $76,000. Despite that difference, Lusk says plenty of his constituents would benefit from a new FBI headquarters and all that thrives around it. We've got to try to elevate. We've got to try to help these residents get into positions that are going to pay them a more competitive wage and salary. And we want to move them into the middle class. But equity is just one of five criteria under consideration for the FBI's new location, including transportation, cost to acquire and build out the site, if it's shovel ready or not, and also its proximity to other locations that are important to the FBI's mission, like DOJ, the White House, and Quantico. But just getting to this point has been a long time coming with And he said, look, we've got a building that's falling down. Longtime Maryland Congressman Steny Hoyer recalls how that request set off a national search for a new FBI location, leading to the three sites under consideration today. And then a setback. We were just about ready to have a selection of the site. And then Donald Trump stopped it. Virginia Democratic Senators Mark Warner and Tim K. Process because he didn't want the current FBI headquarters potentially turning into a hotel. To a hotel that would compete with this hotel. The Trump administration said they were following the FBI's wishes, but the plan was shelved for years as lawmakers for Maryland and Virginia fought together to revive it. But when the GSA renewed the push last fall, unveiling the site's proximity to Quantico as the most important criteria of all, local leaders were divided once again. My response was, uh, that's a fix. There's no way Maryland can be closer to Virginia than Virginia is. Prince George's County is the best site by far. It's not a close call here. Maryland called a press conference that included its entire delegation. The new FBI headquarters belongs here. Virginia doubled down with its own presser, but to its disappointment, eventually the GSA relented, lowering the proximity value to 25 percent, down from 35. I wish they hadn't done that because I think that suggests that it's a little more political than it is on the merits. Even with the existing change criteria, I think Virginia's still a slam dunk. The Springfield location is already filled with government warehouses that would need to be torn down before the new FBI location is built. The selection of those sites is at least, at least a billion dollars more. Both sites are shovel ready in Prince George's County. Virginia disagrees. The idea that somehow a site that's owned by the federal government would cost more than a developing a private sector site, that just doesn't pass the smell test. The arguments have been made, and now the decision rests in the hands of three panel members, two GSA employees, one FBI employee, and their identities remain a secret. What also remains to be seen is whether this new beginning for the FBI headquarters, this quest for equity, will benefit those who need it most. Tracy Wilkins, News for I-10. We will see what happens. All right, here's a look at what's coming up next in the rundown. I'm Adam Tuss. So many people are going electric these days, right, with their vehicles. And now 
So is Metro. Coming up next, I'm going to take you inside the new all-electric bus and show you how it could impact your commute. Along a busy section of 355, students in elementary, middle, and high school have to board the bus right here. What parents are saying and what the school district is doing about it. Whether you need electrical, plumbing, or HVAC service, FH First expert technicians have you covered. Now, during our Super Summer Comfort event, schedule any of FH First award-winning services and score $75 off. That's an astonishing $75 off any electrical, plumbing, or HVAC service now only during FH First Super Summer Comfort event. From flickering lights, pesky leaks, to keeping you cool during the sweltering summer heat, you know who to call. 877-COMFORT-FHFIRST.COM Electric vehicles are growing in popularity, and Metro is getting in on the game with electric buses. I'm, I'm just a little cold. That's I was going <laughs> to. Why I have this on. Okay. Sean's got a. Yes, go ahead. She's got a smock on. I was a little cold. <laughs> We're doing a little light painting here during the commercial breaks. <laughs> <laughs> they just got a big federal grant Metro did to convert bus garages to serve all electric vehicles. <laughs> As News Force transportation reporter Adam Tuss reports, operating those buses will come with a learning curve. A big $104 million check from the federal government. And a party complete with a DJ here in Lorton. All for Metro's electric push. The transit agency now has two all-electric buses and more are coming. The first expected to be on the road this fall. And who better to ask about how they'll work than 24-year Metro mechanic Kelvin Hall. So. Yeah, from a mechanic standpoint, I mean, does it change anything for, for you? It makes the job a little easier. It makes the job cleaner, right? Not but, not the grease all over the place, that yeah, kind of stuff? Yeah, not the grease and the oil and, and, and old things yet. All right, so the big reveal with an electric bus, right? We want to see what's powering this thing. Inside here, the back of the bus, this is two lithium-ion batteries. There are two more on the top of the bus. That's what's going to power the bus and keep it going, hopefully, for a long time on the road. For comparison, this is what the back of a current diesel Metro bus looks like. Many, many parts. Now, Metro GM Randy Clark admits there's still some unknowns about the exact range of these electric buses, how long they'll be able to go in between charges. This thing never stops, has hundreds and hundreds of people on it, have massive amount of air conditioning, all these doors, all these systems. This thing has to work all day long. And mechanic Kelvin agrees. If it only stays on the, on the road for four hours, then we got to turn it. We ha we'll need twice as many buses. Right. Whereas it, as a diesel, now they're dirty, but you can send them out there. Pretty much, they'll be out there all day long. That's why Metro is now converting a number of bus garages to all electric facilities. The goal is to have the entire Metro bus fleet with zero emissions by 2042. Also, some of the grant money Metro received will be used to train first responders on how to deal with battery safety. In Lorton, Adam Tuss, News 4. And Metro officials also say the new buses are very, very quiet, which will cut down on noise pollution as they roll around the neighborhood. <laughs> That's very good. <laughs> Wish we could cut down on some of this driving pollution. D.C. area drivers are known for being a little bit aggressive out there on the roads, and a new study proves it. A new national study by Forbes ranked the most confrontational drivers in the country. Here's a look at the top five. Arizona topped that list, and two states in our area, West Virginia and Virginia, came in at number three and four. Number two was Rhode Island, as you can see there. The survey also found that more than half of the, the Virginia drivers said they've had an incident where the other drivers got out of their cars to yell at them or to fight them. What is going on, D.C. area? Come mm. on now. By the way, Maryland ranked 19th on this list. So what are the top reasons for road rage? Well, heavy traffic topped the list, feeling stressed, running late, feeling angry, and feeling tired rounded out the top five. Those are not reasons for road rage, people. And okay. large, loud buses wasn't on there either. Right. But we're working on that too. Yes. As students head, Sean, back to school across the region, there's a few experiencing issues with the bus routes, the school buses, that is. One group of parents in Montgomery County are extremely frustrated with their kids being dropped off and where they're being dropped off. News Force Juliana Valencia has their story and what the school system is doing about it. Along a busy stretch of 355 in Germantown, Dozens of students from Montgomery County Public Schools have to board the bus to elementary, middle, and high schools. 
Many parents, even for the older students, wait with them out of concern for their safety, like Father Ricardo Aparicio. Car the speed limit is like 45 miles per hour, but, but if you see they're not running like 45 miles an hour, but probably like top on the 50s. The kids at this stop live in Middlebrook Gardens, the only mobile home community in the county with more than 200 homes. I'm more worried like, you know, do not get like, you know, hit or hit and run or something like, you know, and, and oh my God, it's going to break my heart. Parents have been vocal about their concerns and Montgomery County School Board member Grace Rivera Oven has been trying to help. So last school year we had a mom who got hit by a car. Yeah, trying to prevent a child from running into the road. Rivera Oven says that mom is okay, but she doesn't want anyone else to get hurt. She's worked with families in this community for over 20 years and says sometimes there are more than 100 children out here just for elementary school. She's hoping for a crossing guard. We have a lot of new students this year as well that might not know where to stand or, you know, or how dangerous 355 can be. The situation is getting some attention. This morning, MCPS's chief of district operations was out here, as well as the chief of staff for council member Will Jawando for Rivera Oven, who spends a lot of time with these kids. She hopes this year some kind of change actually happens. There has to be a way that we can do this in a matter that it's safe for our children. And I know every adult, whether you have a child or not, you might have a nephew, a niece, a godson. We all want our children to be safe, especially when they're going to school. We could be having a police officer out here, but Montgomery County Public Schools tells me regardless if it's an officer or a crossing guard, that that is under Montgomery County Police's jurisdiction and that the school district is willing to work with the department to see if that can be a solution. In Montgomery County, Juliana Valencia, News 4. Thanks, Juliana. Now, MCPS says their smaller education buses do enter the community, but their larger buses are unable to. And the school district says they'll be marking a waiting area more prominently and will work with management of the community to do outreach and community meetings to engage those parents. They also added that tomorrow and in the coming days, they'll assign security rovers to the bus stops to enhance safety as well. Still to come in the rundown tonight, Tommy's going to take us to a pinball sanctuary in an organic market in the scene. All right, grocery stores are always adding new elements to delight shoppers. And in College Park, one market went beyond just the coffee bar and dessert case. <laughs> yeah, I got a special look inside a Prince George's County organic market whose pinball machine collection, well, it will rival pretty much any in the U.S. in the scene. Check it out. Scott Nash. There was Blinkens hit it and <laughs> keep it away from the bottom as much as you can. Is the CEO of Mom's Organic Market and in his free time. They're engineered for gameplay, but they're also designed for art. And they're a perfect combination in my opinion. He's a pinball wizard. There's a lot of joy in pinball. To me, it's the perfect, call it whatever, hobby, sport. Uh, that's what's great about it. It's just a lot of fun. That's called a live catch, what you just did. A what? A live catch. Oh, I meant to do that. It may have been, yeah, uh, it may have been unintentional. <laughs> I, every, everything good here was completed by accident. Collecting pinball games is a little bit almost as addictive as playing them. At Mom's in College Park. Behind the freezer section, a pinball player's paradise. I feel like pinball brings people together. Scott's personal collection, open to the public for everyone to play. There it goes. Hey! Every shot is... Um, That's yeah, something good to happen. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> we have a good mix here. It's the old games. It really spans 50 years of pinball games here. Zooming out from here, how would you describe the pinball scene around the area? Pinball scene is, is, is vibrant. When I first started um, having my games open to the public uh, six, seven years ago, there weren't many places. And now um, there's been a kind of a renaissance with pinball. And here it comes, it's coming out the top. Yeah, just, just, just keep slapping away at it up there. And um, they're all made in America. The manufacturers, the pinball games, I think, have gotten better. They're as good as we're at kind of peak pinball when it comes to design. Moms in College Park also hosts tournaments and pinball leagues for players of every skill level. 
It keeps going right down the center. <laughs> I would have gone to that grocery store growing up. I would have too. <laughs> but the problem is my, my mom would never know where I was because right. I would always be over there playing the paintball machines. How fun is that? It is so cool. And so uh, our, our guy, he like had a collection mm -hmm. and then he just expanded to everyone. I love that it's just, it's like if you know, you know kind of thing. Right. Well, yeah. I, I love the fact that he thought instead of letting these just be in my basement or a warehouse, mm -hmm. I want to share them with the public. Yeah, totally. I think that's a lot of fun. And you go in, you, you use a quarter, a quarter machine, like old school. It was really it was really a good time to be in there. And you're in there and the energy starts going and the flippers start going. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now if they could just serve alcohol, too. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> it's mom's organic. <laughs> oh, yeah. They have, they have organic <laughs> wine, Tommy. All right. That'll do it for the News 4 Rundown. Thanks for joining us. I'm Sean Yancey. I'm Tommy McFly. We'll see you back here tomorrow.